blessed is the man with a vision. Hallelujah. Lord, again, you're the source of truth. And ultimately, it's only your truth that is the foundation for anything, for anything that is meaningful and stable. Pray for your grace and wisdom here as I share this morning and uh, that you will guide my words, that it'll be for your glory, and I pray that it'll be for the encouragement and building up of those who are here. We commit it into your name, in Jesus' name. Well, once again, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is part three of my message on men, women, and marriage, basically a biblical perspective or a biblical defense of men, women, and marriage. Been, uh, it's been motivated extensively by my um, as I've already shared, but it, 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 kind of the backdrop of it is we're dealing with a culture that has embraced the lie of, of the devil. At the very beginning, where the serpent tempts Eve, it, one of the things he does is he says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And then after she responds, he says, well, no, 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 God's holding out on you. God knows as soon as you eat of the fruit of the tree, of knowledge of good and evil, you will be God. You'll, you'll, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing what's right and wrong, what's true and false for yourself. We live in a culture that's embraced the lie, that questions what the Bible has to say, that, uh, that disputes and rejects the truth of God's word, the fundamental principles, and that basically in the process then embraces, I get to be God for myself. I get to define myself. And we see that expressed in our culture in terms of what it is to be a man, right? Or a woman. Or a whatever anymore. And even the very definition of what is marriage. What is it there for? Who, who created? How is it defined? And what's the role of all of it? What's the role of each of us in the process? So, again, by way of backdrop, we're living in a situation where the, you know, the devil is attacking our culture. He hates God. But the devil ultimately can do nothing to attack God. I think I've got a little bit of a ring here uh, uh, in, in the sound. So, what, you know, the devil can't attack God, so what does he do? He hates that which is part of the creation that was made in God's image. So... What does he do? He seeks to deceive and to destroy mankind. He wants to undermine and deceive marriage that was instituted by God. And basically to create a whole confusion. We see it expressed in a whole confusion and redefinition of what it is. What's, what's marriage about? What is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? And frankly, re-education. There's different parts of the culture that seek to re-educate men basically to take away manliness. Now, we always have to keep in mind, we live in a fallen culture. Culture, We're fallen creatures, right? I was born in with a sin nature. I'm saved only by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And this whole business of learning how to walk as a godly man, that's a process. And that's true with all of us. Whether you're a man or a woman, we all are redeemed, we're imperfect, but we need to look to God for his wisdom. What's, what's the devil's ultimate objective here? He wants to lead us down a path that perverts and mocks the very image of God himself. He wants to frustrate and destroy the purpose for which God created you and me. He wants to cause us, the crown of his creation, basically to go on a suicidal path. And that's really a a good deal of what we see happening in our culture. And I'm not just talking about individuals, but very cultures can basically commit suicide. There is a saying historically that great empires, they, they may ultimately be defeated by some outside enemy, but ultimately what led to their defeat is their self-destruction. And one of the things we saw earlier in the previous studies is when God created man, he said, be fruitful, multiply, as well as exercise dominion over the earth. That's part of what God designed. It's to his glory to have that. And of course, when we go to things like 
gay marriage and so on, that is totally at odds of what God designed, his intention, his desire. Now, I need to move on now to the constructive side, but I, that's the backdrop. That's part of what motivated this series in my heart, trying to provide, however imperfectly, some sort of a biblical and, if you will, a theological framework for why we should believe what we believe about what it is to be a man, to be a woman, what is marriage, what's the role of all of it. And coming back, picking up a little bit on, on last week, interdependence of the sexes. As I pointed out in the first session, God is a God of diversity, isn't he? You look at the creation, you, the, the myriad of variety in plant and animals, the myriad of variety in, in the, the solar systems and, and all that's discovered, everything down to the molecular level and, and the atomic level and the subatomic level to the formations of novas and constellations and everything that's in the sky. The creation and the scripture reveal a God of phenomenal diversity, but each unit, each part of that creation is not just there for itself, it's part of something else. It's part of a greater whole to be functioning and to interact with. And that's true whether you're talking about the gravitational pull of a planet around the sun, that's true in the home. It's true in our culture. It's true in the church. We all are a part. It isn't just about me. I'm a part of something else, something greater and larger than me. And while God is very concerned about you, he's very concerned about me as individuals. We're not just numbers in God's eyes. Each of us, he cares for each of us intimately. But it's not just about me either. I'm part of something else. I'm part of a family. As Greg said, we're part of generations that, that came before us who contributed to a piece of where we are and why we are where we are. We're part of a generation that, is, that we're sowing into the future. So it isn't just about me. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes about the interrelation again of husband and wife. In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of the woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman and all things are from God. Eve wasn't made separately from the dust. As I said, if God would have wanted to, he could have just, when he wanted to create Eve, he could have just gone about, you know, the same way he did with Adam. He formed her body and breathed directly into her. That's not how he did it. He used Adam's rib. So she was made out part, she came out of his body, literally, in, in the process. And I mentioned some imagery, you know, there's the idea of, of she came from his rib, close to his heart, under his arm, they, they stand close together, and so on. There's a certain imagery that, that comes out of that. So she's not independent of man, but at the same time, she will, okay, she was formed from Adam's body, but what follows in all generations after that? All men come from the woman's body, right? We need each other. All future generations came through women. Man is not independent of woman. Woman is not independent of man. We need each other. Without each other, we're headed toward a, a, <laughs> a bad course. Now, I'm talking to people here who are married also, those who are single or young and, and not yet married. We're still a part of a larger body of Christ, and God wants us to function in a manner that it isn't just about me, but how can I be a blessing? How can I be a service? How can God use me to bless and serve others? So God's intention for the union of husband and wife is, well, more than just two individuals who live together and take each other's needs, but the ideal, the thing we strive for by the grace of God, emphasized by the grace of God, to be the closest of friends, companions, somebody who can face the good and the bad of life together, because we all face challenges, we all face difficulties. Somebody who can also enjoy God's creation as well as sharing the stewardship of what's there. 
Can we glorify God by just going for a walk and enjoying a sunset? And you most certainly can. Can we glorify God by just enjoying watching some children play out on the, the yard? Is that something that can be done to the glory of God? Yes. God did create us to enjoy his creation and part of his design in marriage is you've got a companion to enjoy it with as well as a companion to share in the labor because life involves work too. The specifics vary, but it also is there, his design, that we share in the stewardship of exercising dominion on the earth where each of us uses and needs the other, but we're here to be used and give ourselves to others. That's God's overall design. I'm going to wade into now something that is not a particularly popular topic in the world today, but it's a part of the dynamics of what God has put in the marriage, and that's the authority relation. This is not a good way for me to be politically correct, I suppose, but it's, uh, you know, discussion a little bit about the dynamics of the, what God has revealed for us in the headship that God has placed in the home. Now, I suppose I should preface it with this. This is not going to be a family life today seminar or love and respect. There's a lot of curriculums and books out there that go into all the details. This is going to be more just kind of some fundamental foundational and, if you will, theological basis. But I, I hope that provides a framework that as you face some of the challenges in this life and that further development and research and study may be, you know, be of some uh, some benefit, but the authority relationship. I'll, I'll just start back in Genesis 2, 23. Okay, God named Adam. Who named Eve? The Bible says Adam named Eve. Now, we may not always appreciate it, but that is an expression in itself of authority. The one who has authority over another is the one who has the prerogative to name it. God put Adam in authority over the rest of creation. So who named the horse the horse? Who named the dog the dog? Who named the cow the cow? And so on. It was Adam. That is an expression of authority. And to this day, when somebody has a baby, who gets to name the baby? Mom and dad, right? That, that's in God's order. That's the way it works. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 3 and also 8 and 9, Paul makes this comment. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. I'm going to come back a little later to that part about the head of Christ is God, but continuing on. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Okay, that verse can probably rankle the feathers of some people in our politically correct culture that somehow suggests, you know, there's this authority relationship between a husband and a wife. Well, why stop there? How about Ephesians chapter 5? <laughs> Let's wade into it a little more, you know, getting, getting hot water with a politically correct culture. And I know it's easy to do here because I'm preaching to the choir where I think all or if 99%, if not all of you, you know, share the same views. But Ephesians 5, what does Paul say? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. What? For a husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, Paul went on to talk to husbands about their job of laying down their lives as the head. And I know you don't want to be here for two hours, so I'm not going to, you know, there's a lot more that can be and should be said, all right? But I'm, for the moment, I'm just going to key in on, on that part about this whole notion that the, the man is supposed to be the head of the family. I mean, what, how does the world interpret that today? What's the reaction today? You know, isn't that, that's male chauvinist domination of women, right? Isn't it? Isn't it this view of, you know, that 
Submission to a husband is demeaning and, and treating women as though they are, you know, lesser and, and, and they're, they're holding them back. They're depriving women their identity, their true fulfillment in life. What, what, what's so much of the common world out there? Oh, don't, mom, don't waste your time raising kids. Make something of yourself, as though being a godly mother and wife is not making something of yourself. I mean, isn't that what's out there? That kind of a, a viewpoint, if we hold to it, is going to rankle and does rankle the theory, the, uh, a whole lot of feathers in a very politically correct culture. So I want to approach this from, again, a little bit of a theological perspective, but let me offer some thoughts for you. Do you suppose the doctrine of the Trinity might offer some insight here? If your answer is, huh, or what, that's okay. To be honest with you, I was a believer for a number of years, and I had no clue as to the fact that the fact that God has revealed himself as a triune God would have anything to do with the home, with marriage, with the body of Christ, with culture in general. Well, let me wade into that and give you a few thoughts. This a little bit of systematic theology. Uh, just talk a little bit about insight from the Trinity. What it, the doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus Christ is the second member of the Trinity. Fully God, fully man. I'm focusing in particular on Jesus now, right? He's fully God, fully man. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So that tells us Jesus was, came from the very beginning of creation, right? He was there with the Father. He's with the Holy Spirit. When God said, let there be light, Jesus is there with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's fully God. There's a little bit more. There's a, a, a great deal we could spend. I'm just going to look at a, a few verses on this. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 15, it says, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now there's a lot packed into those verses, and I can only partially discuss it this way, but suffice it to say, the scripture reveals Jesus Christ is fully God, right? And draw upon the, the, the Nicene Creed. If you're not familiar with that, that came out in uh, 325 AD. The second article of the Nicene Creed says this, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of God, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. The Nicene Creed came out in 325 AD and it was to deal with a, a heresy that had come out that because Jesus was the Son, begotten of the Father, he was somehow a lesser part of the Trinity. A fundamental part of biblical Orthodox Christianity is Jesus Christ is the true deity. He was begotten of the Father, but he's co-equal, he's co-substantial, co-eternal, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm going to tie this into marriage here in just a little bit, so bear with me. In the Trinity, what do we see? We see full equality. The Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are equal members of the Trinity. They're co-eternal. They've been there since eternity. They're omnipotent. They're omniscient. Just to name some of the qualities of what 
it is to be God. And the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. Okay, that's the starting point. So, and you might say, so what? What's that got to do with what we're talking about, about the headship of, of man over the woman in the marriage? Well, does the Bible reveal any evidence that Jesus submitted himself to the Father? I'm glad you asked that question because the answer is yes. There's a, there are a number of verses and passages that reveal that. I, I'll only be able to cover a few, but for example, in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does also. Okay? Then we'll move on to... John chapter 8, verse 27. I do nothing on my own account in authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. Or John chapter 12. I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So, take a minute and let me ask you this. Do we see Jesus going out there and saying, you know, I'm going to establish my own identity here in, as, as God. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have my own separate identity from the Father. That's not what those verses suggest, does it? We see him relying on and, and turning to the Father. We can see that evidenced also in the fact that Jesus had a prayer life. When in his humanity... Through the incarnation, what do we see him do? Repeatedly, he goes to the Father. He seeks the Father. He looks to the Father for guidance, for wisdom, for strength. So we see more in Jesus' submission culminating in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does Jesus pray there? Father, is there any way you can take this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Okay? He embraced the torture, the horror, and the pain of the cross in submission to the Father. He submitted to the Father in all that he said, but he also did so voluntarily. Jesus also said in John chapter 10 that I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. He wasn't pressured. He wasn't forced to do what he did. He voluntarily embraced what had been set out for him by the Father, and he worked in unity with him. So, okay, let's raise a question then. How does the world, how does the world view this whole idea of the husband's the head of the wife? You know, Scripture reveals Jesus submitted to the Father. And as I read previously in the one passage, it says the head of Christ is God. So does that mean Jesus is a lesser part of the Trinity? Put your thinking cap on. Is that how the world, in that much of how the world treats authority relationships? Is Jesus somehow not quite as fully God as the Father? It, does that mean the Father's just dominating Jesus and, and holding him back and keeping him down in subjection? I mean, just some, applying some simple logic that you see argued today in the dynamics of how people want to attack the biblical foundation of marriage. The answer to the question is categorically no. As soon as you go down that path, as soon as you start saying, well, you know, Jesus, he's not quite fully God. You know what that's called? Heresy. That's not just an area where uh, we can agree to disagree. I mean, we need to always walk in love, but 
the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Jesus are among the doctrines that we need to hold on to firmly, lovingly, but they are part of the essential part of biblical Orthodox Christian faith. Whatever different flavors, there can be a lot of different flavors, in, if you will, culturally and, and so on in the church, but there are certain essential elements that define it that is among them. Categorically, no. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit in every way. So, looking on the, some guidance, the Trinity as a model. The Bible reveals a triune God, one God, but it's got three identifiable persons in that Godhead. And that is, again, that's a mystery, right? And we need to understand that is a mystery. We say there's one God but three persons, and our brains, I mean, kind of conceptually we can say that, but yet there's a part of us that goes tilt. That makes no sense. But that's how God has revealed himself to us. One God, three persons. We see Jesus submitting to the Father, yet he is fully God, co-equal with God the Father and the Holy Spirit in every way. It's not a function of inequality or anything of that nature. And we don't see, uh, we, we do see different roles, different positions of authority, but that doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. In the Trinity, we see perfect unity. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you see the Father. In the Trinity, we see perfect unity, and God is concerned about unity. We see plurality, different persons, but complete harmony, different roles with a unified purpose. I, in the first session, I talked, used some analogies to an engine. It's got a lot of different parts. You got the gears, you got the pistons, you got the valves, you got the spark plug, and a whole host of other components. Each is very different, each does something different, but it all needs to work together for the engine to fire, for it to work properly. Or a symphony with many instruments that look different, that make different sounds, that work differently, and in any given moment may even be playing different notes, but yet are to harmonize. One thing we don't see in the Trinity, we don't see competition and strife. Do we see Jesus saying, don't pay attention to the Father, look at me. We don't see that, do we? It's exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. Rather than strife and competition, we see them honoring each other. What does God the Father do when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist and is coming out of the, the water. We see the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, and God the Father verbally, audibly says, actually the, the, the accounts are slightly different. In one of the gospel accounts it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. As though where God is talking to the people who are present but in Jesus' hearing. In one of the other accounts, and I don't remember which was which now, it says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father speaking directly to the son, but in the, the presence and hearing of others. See other occasions, such as on the Mount of Transfiguration, God the father again says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased. Listen to him. And the Ephesians, or pardon me, Philippians tells us that because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him and gave him a name above all names. We see God the Father giving honor and glory to his son, do we not? And do we see Jesus giving honor and glory to his father? Don't we see him saying, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. You know, you can pray directly to the Father now. If you want to pray, pray, our Father who's in heaven. He came to reveal God as a Father to the redeemed. He honored and glorified. He said, Father, glorify your name in John chapter 12. 
We don't see competition and strife and infighting. We find instead a unity and a mutual harmony and love. With perfect harmony. So, questions for, our, for us in the home. Does jealousy, competition, and strife prevail in the home? Now, we're all human. And I, I do need to say this when it comes to the dynamics of husbands living with their wives and vice versa. The authority relationship, again, this isn't going to be a, a weekend to remember conference or love and respect. There are a lot of curriculums and, and that can do a lot more to flesh it out and fill it out and all the dynamics of what goes into that. And I also need to acknowledge, has this been abused? Has the authority relationship in the home been abused? Well, yeah, of course it has. But let me add this, there is probably no doctrine, no principle of God's truth that cannot be or has not been misapplied abused, perverted. There's probably hardly anything out there that, of God's truth that between the devil and our sinful nature, we can really make a mess sometimes. And that can range in, in, even in the marriage relationship from the man and the wife, they're trying to do the right thing before God, but they're, you know, we're all a work in progress. We make mistakes, we fall short. And we need to ask for forgiveness to the extremes of there are even cultures today that certainly will not go into details, but that treat women with incredible cruelty as, that, frankly, little more than property. So has it been abused? Sure it has. But we need to distinguish between what is the truth of God's word and its proper application from the abuse and the lies and the misapplications that can happen in a fallen world. Our goal is by the grace of God to find redemption so that piece by piece we can grow. But anyway, I need to continue on. Is there jealousy? Well, the, the Trinity calls us to put aside jealousy and strife. God's very concerned about unity. And for the sake of time, I won't try to read it, but in Philippians 2, Paul talks about Considering others is more important than yourself, and, and considering the interests of others ahead of your own. Or in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about you need to work hard to maintain unity in the body of Christ. God is very concerned about harmony and unity in the home, in his church, in any culture. Do we consider others as more important in our home, more important than ourselves? The triune God revealed three persons, but they provide an example of different persons, different roles, but equal in every way and in complete harmony. So the Apostle Paul says this about men and women. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In Christ Jesus, both men and women are equal. Man has no higher standing before the Lord Jesus Christ than a woman. In Christ Jesus, all the barriers of race and gender and culture and all the different other ways that we can tend to come up to divide ourselves as people in Christ Jesus, that, that's where those barriers can be brought down. The law can only do so much. It takes the power of the gospel in Christ Jesus to bring unity. And that's true in the home. It's true in the church. It's true in the cultures. It doesn't mean there aren't different roles. It doesn't mean there aren't different genders. Yeah. There's men, there's women. We're different. We're wired different. We're supposed to be different. Right. I have to keep reminding myself of that at times when my wife and I have a few discussions. But, you know, we're, it's supposed to be that way. God designed it that way. And probably more often than not, it's my fault, you know, as a practical reality. I'm a sinner. I, I was saved by the grace of God. But 
There are different rules, but God created us, male and female, to reflect his glory, both made in his image. The differences in design and the purpose that he gave for us doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. Quite the contrary, we are all precious in God's eyes. There is no distinction in that regard. So, some application. Men, husbands, fathers, those who are married, do we love our wives and cherish them even as Jesus Christ cherished his bride? Jesus didn't come to just require everybody to serve him. What did he do? He put aside his divine privileges, became a man, and he died on the cross for his bride. God calls us as men to sacrifice for our, our brides. Do we show honor to the wives as joint heirs, as equal heirs in Christ Jesus? Wives, do we show respect to the husband as your God-given head, seeking to encourage him to follow the Lord? There's a lot, again, that can be said to flesh that out. But anyway, let me offer, let's just take a few thoughts for prayer here, and then we'll have communion. Lord, help us to rely on the truth of your word as the foundation of our faith. Help us to trust that the design you have incorporated into who we are and what we are, that we're not a mistake, that we're not an accident, that you knew what you were doing. Help us, Lord, in the the home, in the church, in the world. Help us. Help us to embrace the design that you've given to each of us and the, the calling that you've placed on us. Help us to stand firm for the truth of your word. That includes how you define what men are, what women are, and what you've defined for marriage. Help us to hold fast, to be faithful to that. To, uh, and Lord, for that we need your strength. We need your strength and your wisdom. Help us to be faithful to the message of your love to the world, including the beauty that you have created in all the world around us, but also in the, the beauty of the, what you've created in men, in women, and also in, in how you've called men and women in the proper time and season for marriage. That, Lord, ultimately it may be for your glory, for your beauty. In Jesus' name, amen.